Hey, everybody. All right. Um, how's everybody doing? Is it a good conference? You having a fun time? Huh? All right. Yeah, yeah. I get it. You're tired. It's been a few days. You still get everybody sticking around for the Cloud Raider Summit in the next two days, right? Everybody's ready for another two days of just coding? Miles is. Uh, OK, awesome, awesome. Um, all right, so uh, first up, we're, we're going to have, uh, we were so lucky to get this talk, uh, actually kind of last minute, but I'm really excited about it because PM2 has become like something that everybody seems to be talking about and kind of depending on. Um, so everybody give it up for uh, Alexander to talk about his project, PM2, uh, and how much you all love it. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, OK, lightning talk. I'm not used to that, so I'm, I will try to go, it fast, to go fast. So basically, PM2 is a process manager I built three years ago with the community. And it's a process manager that allows you to keep alive your website and make it more performant in production environment. Uh, it's on GitHub, and uh, you can start it. Uh, this is like um, the download location of PM2 in real time. So every, every time there is someone that downloads PM2, you can see like, some, like a line on this map. So it's quite nice. You can see that it's quite global. And uh, we have like more than 12, uh, almost 14 million downloads. This is it. OK. This is in the last 24 hours. So it's quite nice. So basically, I don't have any slides. So I will go straight to the code. Um, OK, so I just start with like a simple application. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but this is like a simple HTTP application that you run, uh, like it's an express server. Uh, basically, you do a node uh, myapplication.js to start it. But now you can do like to can start it with PM2. So PM2 start my node.js application. And after, you can use the cluster mode. So directly with dash E max, you can say, I want to make this application cluster, like depending on the number of CPUs, automatically. So before uh, just uh, launching this command, I launched PM2 monit. And Basically, when I start my application, now I can see that this application is been, uh, has been, has been uh, clustered in four processes. So basically, the number of CPUs on my machines. And on the left, there you can see the PM2 monit command that allows you to see the CPU and memory usage of each application. So I'm going to run a simple benchmark uh, with WRK to uh, on the no the, the port on that uh, that port. And you can see that the requests are being load balanced automatically. So you don't need to change anything on your code. You just do pm to start dash e uh, your application, and it will start your application in cluster mode, making it much more reliable and, uh, and, uh, and performant. There is also the reload without any downtime. So you do pm to reload all, and it will reload your application. will pop four new processes. will wait that the old like, processes all the requests, and the four new ones will take place. After you have, uh, like, uh, you can declare each application uh, into, a pro into a configuration file. So, for example, uh, you can see there that there is, like, it's a YAML file, but it can be a JSON file. So, I have a web API that will start this application.js, and also I have the worker app that starts the worker.js, and a elf check that is a bash script. So directly, I just start my application like that. I just start the process.yml file. And it starts your application. Sorry for the display. Uh, it starts all the application uh, very easily. So it's very convenient. After, you can restart all this application just by doing pm2 restart process.yml. And it will restart each application. So uh, after, um, what can I show? <laughs> So basically, uh, this is it for PM2. Uh, like uh, we just published the version two of PM2 yesterday. So there are a lot of announcements for Windows, uh, for um, uh, like uh, less CPU and memory usage uh, and um, and Docker integration. So we made like a specialized CLI uh, that you can put into your Docker file to uh, directly uh, let PM2 manage your Node.js processes. So it's going to forward all the signals and uh, do graceful stop. So it's better for production uh, Docker uh, container. And uh, we also built something like. 
like let's say uh, I have this application, but uh, this application unfortunately has a V8 profiler, so it needs like a native compilation. So now you can do like something like PM2 Docker dev, and you say which application you want to start. When you do this, it generates a Docker file that is automatic configured. Okay. Yep. I start this application, it, uh, it do a uh, Docker build, and after it does a Docker run, so now I can go to my browser and it just like works. And basically what happened during this phase is that we generate a Docker file, a Docker file that uh, integrate like uh, different things, so it install PM2, it then install the, it copy the package.json into, uh, into uh, the Docker, it does an npm install inside it, and after it does like a run dev command, so you start your application and just in case you change any file, it will restart it. And after you have like the distribution mode, so basically just PM2 docker dist, and you put the key matrix image, enfin an image. And this uh, will change the Docker file, will uh, switch uh, the, uh, the, the way of exposing file. It will not be as a volume, but we do like a raw copy of your source code into the Docker container. And after directly you can, you see there is a graceful shutdown. And after you can just Docker commit and Docker push like this container that is pre-configured directly uh, into production. So uh, now uh, I will go fast, but uh, I made an announcement uh, when I was in GSConf in China. It's about grid control, it's about making PM2 uh, connected together. It's like a network layer that uh, we built on top of PM2 that allows you to reproduce like uh, the Amazon AWS uh, Lambda systems, but on-premise on your own servers with like discovery system, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file transfer thanks to my Fintouch and Hyperdrive, and uh, with like a pub sub system uh, that, is, that looks like uh, the Amazon AWS Lambda. So basically, I will go very fast, but you do grid sample, it will generate like this kind of file. So it's a file that integrates a public key and a private key, SSH key. And after you say the list of servers you want to provision, once you have this file configured, you just do grid provision. Grid provision, it will go to, it will SSH to each machine, it will install everything needed, like you don't need to install anything. Like in a raw server, it works very well. And after, once you did that, uh, you will be able to see like this list of servers. So basically, uh, I'm just going. <laughs> okay, hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, just this is the thing. If you haven't looked at it, so basically I linked, uh, I provision each Android uh, computer there with grid control that allows me to have like my personal uh, small network. <laughs> and now, uh, with this, I can. Uh, each computer has recognized themselves like in a private network and I can do like, I can trigger function on this uh, grid. Uh, basically I can do like a simple thing like multi SSH. It, uh, this is the interface, like uh, it's an interface uh, that allows you to, to see like in an efficient way uh, uh, the execution of a command, so you just use page, up, page down to see uh, the result of this command. And basically, uh, let's look at a simple application. Toto, yes. <laughs> I do npm install. So this is like a sample application to use a grid. So it, it will install an API to, of a, in sim, in si, sample API to, to interact with the grid. Okay. And now you can see that there is like a task folder with some task on it, like for example, echo.js. So you can see that it's a bit like uh, Amazon AWS Lambda. It's like uh, it takes a first argument like uh, parameters and uh, a callback. So basically, I have this main application that will call this task. So I require my API, I say the number of instances of each task, and after I say I want to execute echo return, so that function I just showed you before, once my grid is ready. So I just launched this. Okay. Je uh, utilise grisage. So this is like a small dashboard that allows you to see the progress of the synchronization of each node. So now you can see that each node has been uh, synchronized with that uh, source files. And if we go back to our code, you can see that now the private API, because like it's in a local network, uh, change 
So this request is being executed on each computer in a round robin way, so you have like a very scalable way of developing microservices application. Um, yes, and I think I'm almost done. I just show something else. Like, ah, non, ça va être pareil. Okay. Uh, there is like something, for example, you can trigger a task, a task that does, uh, that uses the request module and that asks for the public IP, but uh, as this computers are in a private network, they will get the same IP. But basically, it's a, it's a way of uh, doing uh, microservices uh, based on the Amazon AWS Lambda. And uh, if you want to check it out, uh, it's unfortunate I cannot do deeper on this uh, project, but uh, it's already on open source, and uh, we published it uh, one week ago at the GSConf China, and you can check it out. It's grid control slash grid control. Thank you so much. Well, that was pretty great. <laughs> All right. Uh, following up, uh, we have the wonderful Matteo Kalina from uh, Nearform, who's going to talk a, a little bit about what they do. Uh, everybody give it up for Matteo. Like the legend of the phoenix, huh. all ends with beginnings. What keeps the planet spinning? Uh... Hi, everyone. I am Matteo. That is the name of Kian, our CEO on the, on the agenda. He is, Kian is sorry. He is, doesn't feel very well today, and he couldn't make it. And yeah, that is my slide, if you, if you see. How, how long ago I did, I did it over there, one second ago. So um, yes. So uh, I work with a company. Near firm. I don't know how many of you know us. Probably some of you have known us at the booth or some other conferences or through our, or our open source, uh, our open source work. Near firm, uh, is a company rooted in, in, in open source, even though we are in a uh, tough business. We, we do services. We do professional services. We are a consultancy company. We help companies adopt, adopt Node.js at scale. And we do so by using open source modules. We do Node.js. Uh, we do all the other, we do all the things that you can imagine from a consultancy company. Um, uh, I just want to tell you uh, uh, how I, I, I started working with, 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 with Nearform, because I think it's a nice experience of what we are and what, what is important in open source. I was visiting, was in Ireland, visiting a university doing my PhD. And I did a nice open source module called Level Graph. Um, a colleague of Kian, Dominic Tarr, you probably know Dominic, right? Uh, and uh, was working in Level and said, oh, it's so nice, it's so cool. You should come down uh, to, to the office down in Waterford. And they make me, we had dinner together. And after some months, I joined the family and started working part time at the beginning, but whatever. And yes, um, so uh, near from Roots is it's in open source, and uh, we use open source and we build uh, open source tools that are that are useful for, for the community. And we contribute to Node Core. We sponsor a lot of, of stuff that uh, you guys are probably using um, every day, even though maybe we are a little bit on the side respect of the big products that that you might see and flashy flashy things. So I would really first of all like to thanks. Uh, all of you, because uh, I, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this amazing community, for this amazing ride that is Node.js. And uh, it has been, first of all, an honor for us to be here and uh, to be part of this community. And we try to help in any possible ways. Uh, if uh, we can help you commercially, we are happy to do that. But if we just need help for, with an open source, with core, with uh, some performance, whatever. If you just want to learn Node, we are here to help. Uh, so I have still two minutes left, and I'm half run down what, what I was planning to talk about. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, and I think that uh, I would like to say it's uh, that when we go in uh, with, with most of our customers and when we do our job, uh, we use uh, frameworks like Happy. So probably most, a lot of you have, have used Express, have used Happy. And uh, all of these are born because of the open source community and how we, we made things together. 
So uh, Nearform is, is a good company, and we are almost 100. Uh, yeah, we are hiring, but I'm not saying this. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, we, again, we would really like to thank you all for, um, uh, for being here and to watch me rumbling. And I invite Michael back to the stage and kick me out because uh, it has been a fun, uh, a fun thing throwing, throwing at this. Uh, again, I want again thanks, thanks to all of you. And um, I'm sorry, Kian couldn't make it. He had a nice talk ready, but he was dead, and he couldn't really make it. <laughs> so uh, he did a great job filling in. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 All right. OK, everybody. So I don't think that any of us would actually be able to do anything with Node without NPM. So uh, it's great to have uh, somebody from NPM Inc., Kat Marchand, please come up uh, to the stage and tell us all about this, uh, what's going on in the State of the Union with NPM. Give it up, everybody. <laughs> all right. This works. Can you hear me? Oh my gosh. OK, hi. Hi, I'm Kat Marchand. I am part of the uh, NPM CLI team. That means I actually, I actually code on the actual thing that you install on your machines. Um, we're a pretty small team. Uh, I'm here to give you a little update on the general state of the CLI, updates on what we've been doing, and just go over our plans for the future with y'all. Uh, so first of all, this is kind of an overview of what I'll be talking about. NPM 3 is our current release, and I want to give an update on what's been going on since it originally uh, it came out last year. Like it's, it's about a year old now. Uh, then we have NPM at 4, which is coming out in October. Uh, there's a few breaking changes there that I want to talk about. Uh, NPM at 5, we kind of just decided that we we're going to do that one. It's coming out early next year, uh, most likely. Um, I want to give an update about our LTS policy because we have a, a different one than one, what Node does. Uh, state of triage that the CLI is in all the time, and I'll go more into what that means for us. And finally, talk a little bit about product initiatives that NPM, both as a company and the CLI team, are doing that you can look forward to in the next year or so. So, like I said, it's a year old. This is really exciting. NPM at three was a big deal for us. Uh, it's come a long way since 3.0.0 and 3.3. Like, I know that a lot of you were early adopters, and you saw, you saw like, oh, maybe it's too slow. Maybe the, the, the progress bar was slowing things down, or there were still some, some issues with the installer. That's not really what NPM 3 is like anymore. NPM 3 is a very different beast as of 3.10 something, which is what we're at right now. I think 3.10.8 is latest. Um, so. It came with a lot of changes. It flattened the install. It made NPM more reliable. It fixed a bunch of race conditions that we had. Um, it's already shipping with Node 6. That is our new LTS. Like, this is what you're going to get for the next two years of, uh, of Node LTS. So it's pretty good. Um, next. This, just quick warning, it's an animated GIF. This is what the new progress bar looks like. I like putting this GIF up here because it's actually really cool. It's really fast. It is based on an open source project called Gage, which is maintained by one of, our, one of the other developers, Rebecca, Rebecca Turner. Uh, you know, if you disabled it before, just go ahead and re-enable it. It's fine now. <laughs> so that's all for that GIF. Um, there's a few other things we've been doing for NPM at 3 in the past year. That includes a project to get Travis fully green all the time and just make sure that we're doing that. That was actually pretty hard. We have our entire test suite running on Windows and passing on Windows cons consistently. Um, Windows users should, in general, see a, a vastly improved experience using NPM 3 directly now. You, don't, you shouldn't need any like, compatibility layers or anything like that to get a really good experience with NPM. Uh, we've been also been doing a big bugs push for the past few months to iron out some of the gnarly bugs and corner cases. We define big bugs. Like you'll, you might see that term if you're like in the issue tracker or something like that. So a big bug is any issue that either produces an invalid install or crashes the CLI. Invalid or inconsistent or something like that. It's like you installed the wrong thing. Uh, 
There's a few of those, and turns out that they, they kind of they kind of sit in the little corner cases because the NPM does a lot of things. You know, you're talking about depth dependencies and, and, and bundle and shrink wrap. And speaking of shrink wrap, we have a really major redesign of shrink wrap coming up, supposedly. Apparently, I think so. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's what NPM 5 is going to be about. I'll talk about that uh, a little more when I get to that part. Next up, NPM 4. It's coming in October 2016. It is a lot smaller and less impactful than NPM 3. Like, this is not a, a big earth shaking release, but you know how Semver is? Like, you change one thing and suddenly you get a major, a major bump? That's, that's kind of how that works. Uh, we've, we've been collecting a few small breaking changes over time, and we're like, well, let's just, let's just do a couple of them now. Uh, Part of the other purpose of that is kind of to close the book on the whole NPM 2 versus NPM 3 thing. So like, people still have a perception that these are two different things. Some of that perception was like, from the original release. So we're like, OK, let's just get to, not get to NPM 4. Let's move on. Let's just make sure that people are on the latest version as much as possible. Uh, you'll also see more regular some of our major changes after NPM 4 comes out, which is, well, actually, I'm going to talk about what's actually going in NPM 4. There's, uh, there's three uh, major changes that I want to talk about. The first one is this patch. Uh, so right now, if you're using NPM, your node path of the node that is running the CLI that you just ran, it's going to be prepended to your, uh, to your path variable when you run NPM scripts. This seems kind of benign and like, OK, that's convenient sometimes. It is like some people really want to make sure they get this NPM to run their scripts. On the other hand, it breaks a lot of systems. It breaks NYC and Istanbul. It, it can break uh, uh, Python's virtual env. It can break uh, things like RVM. Anything that manipulates the environment can have its work kind of uh, uh, overridden. So instead, we're going to make it uh, an optional uh, flag. There's going to be a couple of other options for people who need those corner keys because the people who need that stuff really need it. And this is an Adelix patch. So Anna is great. Like, really appreciate her actually taking the time to sit with us and, and talk about the design of this because there's been a lot of you know, back and forth between how to design this feature. Next up is search. Um, NPM search works again. Uh, <laughs> We're sacrificing, so we're, we, we have a temporary thing going in. And we're sacrificing the overall performance and the overall uh, uh, and the sorting ability that the current NPM search has just so we can have something in there that can get NPM search to work. So right now, it's going to be a streaming search. It's going to be incremental and linear. Uh, and it's going to be there until a time where, we, where the registry team is able to build a more thorough uh, search endpoint. And that search endpoint is going to be really fast. So NPM 4, you're not going to blow your heap every time you try and search for hyperterm. Uh, this next slide is a GIF. So this is kind of what NPM search looks like now. It's not, you know, it's not blazing fast, but at least you start getting things right away. And it has like a nice little emoji there. It's a little like the thinking face. Look at it. <sighs> Lastly, this is probably the biggest change that's going into NPM4. And this one is a kind of like roundabout deprecation cycle. We are deprecating the pre-published script and replacing it with a prepare script. And this is, a lot of you probably use pre-publish. Pre-publish is really common for when you're building like your, your assets or something like that. It is also very, very confusing to people because even though it says pre-publish, it does not just run on pre-publish. It runs when you do npm publish and when you do npm install without arguments because the concept is you know, you're preparing for a publish. So after several years of actually arguing what, the, what to call this thing in the CLI, we decided, let's just, let's just bite the bullet. Let's start the deprecation cycle. We're going to deprecate prepublish. You'll start seeing warnings if you use prepublish. Uh, uh, if you want the same behavior, you use the prepare script. That one is the one to use from now on to do exactly what prepublish does now. And if you want something that only works with prepublish, you use prepublish only until the cycle ends, at which point Pre-publish will just be publish only. That might be a while, but there we go. Uh, NPM 5, that's going to, we're, we're hoping to get it out by first quarter 2017. The main thing that's going to go into NPM 5 is a redesign of shrink wrap. 
uh, we're going to refactor what we have right there to make it a lot easier for us to like manipulate data structures and all that stuff and make the code cleaner in general because it's kind of gnarly. Uh, and then we want to figure out what it is the community actually wants from shrink wrap, what you would find useful. Uh, we're going to have a whole process, like, you know, hopefully reach out to people, hopefully figure out what the use cases are as compared to other, um, to other uh, dependency, what do you call this? Uh, the frozen files, whatever, I forget <laughs> what they're called. Anyway, just make sure we know what others are doing and see what works best. It's still going to be an NPM-specific solution because NPM is pretty unique as far as package managers go. Uh, and on top of that, we're going to have a much faster, uh, more robust content addressable cache. That means if you're looking at your cache, it's kind of a mess. It kind of clobbers things depending on name. That's not going to happen anymore. We're going to go by Shasam or something similar. And it's going to be really great. And it's going to enable some cool features that I don't know if I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, but I am going to talk about LTS. So LTS, it stands for long-term support. It is the concept of like we want to make sure that you know that something will work for a long time. But NPM has a couple of restrictions. We are a very small team. We are three people. Um, one of those people is a technical manager, so only two of us are actually regularly contributing code. We have a couple communi community contributors, but not, they're not full-time people. Uh, our real goal with an LTS is we want ver one version of NPM that works really well for node distribution. We want Node to be able to say, OK, we want a version of NPM, and we want it to be reliable. What should we have? And we just give you that one. Meanwhile, we're going to continue our, our regular development process and move things to maintenance more often. Uh, keep in mind, when you think about stability when it comes to NPM, we don't, we don't create that many changes that fast. We actually prioritize stability very, <laughs> very much. Like, we have a very large ecosystem, and it turns out every single little thing we do can have enormous repercussions. So we're very careful about what we actually do. So even if you don't use an LTS, you can expect a, pretty, a fairly consistent, reliable uh, experience. Now that said, if you're a developer, and not just like an automated system that installed Node and then just used the NPM that's there, we strongly prefer that you just update to NPM at latest. It's great. It's fantastic. It's the best. The only NPM there is, because <laughs> it's called NPM. There's anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, so these are the versions. Once uh, NPM at four comes out, this is what you're going to see. We're moving NPM at two to maintenance. Uh, that means that we're going to patch it for major security vulnerabilities and stuff like that. But that's about it. Uh, NPM at three will become our new active LTS. That's the one that's going to go into Node six. That's going to be reliable. That's going to be a while, uh, uh, around for a while. We're going to continue providing patches for it, but no new features. Uh, Node 4 is probably going to go into Node at 7. Like, from here, we're not entirely certain. We haven't talked to folks yet. But NPM 4 should go into Node 7. And by the time NPM 5 comes out, it should be around time for Node 8. Uh, so that's something to look out for. Uh, so I, I mentioned the state of triage earlier. And this is the issue tracker for NPM. This is, this is something I spend a lot of time looking at and a lot of time kind of crying over or screaming over. Like this, is, this slide very much describes my experience in day-to-day -day life there. Um, we have three people. Those three people don't have that much time. Like, even so, we spend a ton of time just going through issues, just managing. Uh, feature requests, making sure that we're in contact with the community. But the reality is we probably can't respond as, as fast as you want. And we do have some help. But So we triage every day. Triaging means that you choose not. You choose the things that are most important and the things that are important enough but that you can actually do. So we, uh, so for example, if it's something that, that is a feature request, that tends to be lower priority, even though we want to keep iterating on, issue, on, on features. If it's something that is too hard to fix, we might actually just like Band-Aid over it and move on. We have a lot, to, a lot of ground to cover. Um, as far as feature requests go, if it's not something that we're going to do ourselves in the next 6 to 12 months, we're closing feature requests. And we're not closing them as in, like, no, we'll never do this. We're closing them. Uh, well, some of them we're not going to do at all. But <laughs> uh, we're closing them so that we can, we can stop keeping track of all these things that we 
probably don't have the time to do. Like if you look at our at our potential feature list for that right now, we're, we're not going to be done for 10, 20 years, right? And we can't do that. Uh, you might see some, some feature requests being closed with patches welcome, because we do close patches welcome requests. That means patches are welcome. Go ahead, and, go ahead and search close issues for patches welcome, and maybe you'll find something you like. Uh, right now, big bugs take priority over features. We are doing that big bug push right now. Uh, once, the, once that's done, maybe we'll do more feature work over time. Finally, Keenan Yildrum, we, he is, he's fantastic. He's been helping us on the, on the tracker. He's been helping us, I think, a little bit on Twitter, but mainly on the tracker. Just keep track of everything. We added Keenan as a contributor recently. And so you'll be seeing Keenan around the tracker, you know, just responding to people, uh, usually taking care of support requests, but also kind of helping us figure out what's going on in the repo. And finally, I want to talk about products. So in the end, NPM is a product. It is a product of NPM Inc. Uh, but we do have some guiding principles as a CLI team. You know, my team has its own, has its own like, goals. Uh, so those guiding principles, and the most important here is that we have a responsibility towards the community. Above all, we are here to make sure that this thing is reliable, consistent, and performant for the entire community, or as much of it as we can manage. Uh, that will override most things that we, that, we, uh, that we mean to do. After that, there are things that we do with the purpose of adding value to the CLI and the larger ecosystem and drawing more people in or drawing people towards products and stuff like that. We are, you know, we're part of a proprietary company, even though I'm, I do open source all the time, which is really great. Uh, so what are our product initiatives as far as that goes beyond just like, anyway. So we have uh, quality and robustness improvements. That means that's our big bucks push. That is uh, making sure that shrink wrap works well, making sure that our cache works well. All that stuff is really, really important to us right now. We want performance improvements. NPM at three is pretty fast now. Like a lot of the performance issues were addressed, but we can make it better. So we're going to keep trying. Uh, Shrink wrap is a huge deal. Like it is something that people talk to us all the time about. They want it to be better. They want this. They want that. We want it to work well for all of you. We want some kind of process that you can use to have reliable installs. You know, reliable, repeatable installs. Uh, on the on the closer to registry stuff side, we have an impro improved logging experience. For that, we're going to be doing. Um, we're kind of overhauling the way NPM login works. And on top of that, we're adding single sign-on. That's the first thing that we're going to add. We might add two-factor authentication, which would be fantastic for some of y'all, especially like on bigger open source projects. Uh, and yeah, that should go out. Like If you're using other registries, you'll be able to like hopefully take advantage of that too. And finally, we want tighter, tighter integration with the new registry. There's a new version of, of, of the registry API coming out that's going to you know, add some fancy new features like bundling installs together. That's part of the, of the, of the cache push. So you know, instead of doing thousands of tiny requests, you're going to collect all the things that you need, see what's in your cache, send that request over to the registry, and you get one big tarball back, and then we put that in where it needs to go, which is <laughs> <laughs> Probably going to make a lot of people's routers a lot happier. And that's it. Please talk to us. We are available for you. You can talk to us on Twitter. You can please go ahead and post issues. I know there's a lot. We, and we might take a while to get to it, but we will do our best to get to it anytime. Uh, finally, I do like some inclusivity diversity stuff kind of on top of that. Uh, there's this community called WeAllJS. It is a it is a general JavaScript community that kind of prioritizes trying to get people together. If you want people who are like you, that's probably a good place to go. It also has a lot of uh, general support resources. It also has a big European population. So if you want to you know, get to talk with a lot of Europeans as, as opposed to a bunch of Bay Area people, that's a really good place. And that's it. All right, yeah. I can attest that the, the progress bar is totally fine now, and it, it's very fast and great. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about this next talk. Um, 
Doug, well, uh, well, everybody knows who Doug Wilson is, right? Okay, like he's basically been like Atlas holding up the whole Express world for quite a while. <laughs> um, Ag Doug's actually never spoken at a big conference like this before, so this is awesome that we were able to give him here. Um, and everybody give it for Doug and his talk and just all of the work that he's done in the community over the years, please. Give it up. <laughs> Woo! All right. So, if you probably all know me, um, at least a little bit from GitHub. My name is Doug Wilson, and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of the union for e the Express project and like, how it actually like, is right now. Not code-wise, but just project management-wise. Um, so I want to start off a little bit, kind of like an overview of, kind of like what Express is, just in case anybody who didn't know. Um, so Express is just a Node web server project. Um, it's actually built on top of the core Node HTTP server itself um, and basically adds a little bit of routing and sugar on top of that. Um, so like it, it provides a way where developers can declare that given this method and this path, execute this piece of code. Um, it gives like a basic little bit of a, a middleware pattern. Um, so p developers can say, this piece of code run under these conditions. Um, it allows them to kind of like compose them together. It's actually been a big driver force of like the ecosystem of Express itself, um, allowing modular, module developers to publish little pieces of code that just manipulate the requests and responses in a reusable way that everybody can incorporate into their applications. Um, so a lot of people might not know this, but in the early 2016, the Express project was actually brought into the Node Foundation as an incubating project. Um, so this doesn't really mean anything from like people using Express, but it, it means a lot to how Express is going to be managed, especially in the future. Um, so part of this is that the Foundation gave us a couple mentors to help guide our project, to help uh, answer our questions, to help tell us like how can we be a better project. In fact, the, f the incubating project is meant to help make projects uh, more participatory, uh, transparent, and effective. Um, part of this is they actually helped us outline uh, project governance. Um, we're actually pretty much using kind of like a default template, really, that the actual incubating project kind of like gives us. Um, but over time, we'll iterate that to make it a lot more suited to to how we're going to be run, but right now it was a really great starting, starting point. Um, in fact, anybody could use the template, even if they're not part of this program. Um, we also, part of this, we went through and we tried to determine like, what the actual founding core contributors to Express was. Over time, we've, Express has actually been around, first commits were actually in the summer of 2009, and then first published to NPM winter 2010. Um, it's been around for a long time and has had people come and go from the project, and we just had a pretty big mess of who the actual contributors even were. Uh, so we actually went through and actually took data points and figured out, you know, who are the core contributors right now, so they can be part, th this would give us a core group of who's going to be part of this discussion for how Express is managed. Um, part of this whole process is the goal is that Express is eventually going to graduate, and what that means is the incubating project has a set of basically metrics about how they know that we're participatory, effective, and transparent. And you know, essentially that we're basically free to go run on our own. Um, and that we, they know that, you know, especially Express being a really big entry point into the Node ecosystem, that you know, it's going to be a well-run project, just like Node itself. Um, so I mentioned that we created our uh, founding contributors. So what we did was from that, and part of this initial governance template is we actually came up with a technical committee, very much similar to the technical committee that is with the node core itself. Um, it's just basically just a people, a group of people that just guide the project. I mean, it's, it's very much like just whatever we need to do. Um, we basically just meet every other week to discuss topics. Um, so the last one was last week. Um, this week was off, and then next week is our next one. Um, and we just usually just discuss whatever we need to. We make decisions if there's some kind of objection. So, like, 
most of the decisions made are not made by the TC, so the TC isn't like a gatekeeper to all decisions. Um, the projects inside there, there'll be discussions. Everybody, we try to let people participate in them, and only if there's something that just doesn't seem to be getting resolved do we actually have to come in and actually say, okay, let's try to make a decision on this. Yes or no, what do we need to do? Is there maybe an action item? Try to get that going. Um, and then we also just discuss new topics to align in direction. So whether or not we need to change some aspect of how the website operates, or maybe we need to bring up like, oh, is this part of the governance not working for us? Or maybe this would be a cool thing if we could do this. Or you know, some recent ones where maybe we should standardize all the, the readmes across all our repos that look similar. Like, OK, cool, let's do that. And so it wasn't how do we do that necessarily. It was like, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Let's start that conversation. Um, and then that's been going on all by itself. TC is not really involved. I mean, the same members that are all the core contributors are on the TC. Um, so the same people are making the conversation, just not really like out there in this actual meeting. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick overview of who these actual TC members are. Uh, so we actually have nine members. Um, and you may or may not recognize some of, or all of them, and they don't all do everything in Express. Express is actually a pretty large project. Um, different people focus on different areas. Um, some do uh, more broader focus, some are more narrow focused. Um, you actually have Blake, Rand, myself, Yappa, Linus, Nick, Troy, Jonathan, and Jeremiah, um, just to give off the kind of list. So, Express is actually a fairly large project. Um, we actually had to, we actually are composed of dozens of modules, all actually managed by the people in Express, not including the modules that we actually just use that are not managed by Express. Um, we actually, this was actually before this, this was actually, I think, 2015 is when we did all this, but we actually s decided that it was getting really unmanageable being inside one GitHub org, so we actually split it among three. And I just wanted to talk about this because I know this is a point of confusion. A lot of people don't know this. And this is actually one of the things we're working on is trying to get this all documented. So we have the Express.js organization, Pillar.js organization, and JSHTP organization all on GitHub. Um, the Express.js organization is really like the main entry point organization. You'll find the actual Express module under there. You'll find its website and then all the middleware that essentially are maintained by the Express team are under there. Those aren't really like official or unofficial or somehow better quality than anything else. They're just maintained. Um, and that comes from the legacy of, especially with Express, it's like, where do people get started? So these are kind of like some wheels that we give them. And a lot of them might have better ones out there. Um, and we certainly welcome to collaborate and participate. In fact, some of the ones in there actually were started outside of Express and were actually essentially said, hey, you know, maybe I don't have a lot of time for this. Um, and actually, they got brought in to the Express organization from outside. Uh, Pillar.js is kind of like our next kind of like layer down. It's the build, you can think of that as like the building blocks of Express. So Express, the module, is made up of various different code pieces, like the router. Um, how does it actually tie in your render request to a view engine? Um, how does it handle errors that you throw? And how does it write that stuff out? All that kind of stuff is actually, we try, we're working on splitting that up. We have a lot split up, still a couple more to do. But we're putting that out there for the community to use just as their own if they want to use pieces of Express but not actually require the entire Express. And that way, Express doesn't have to ex expose a million little exports for these things as actually separate modules. And that's kind of like where those go. And then we actually have our last organization, which is the lowest level, JSHTTP. This is actually where we sit all of our low-level HTTP-related things. So we have a lot of different code in there. In fact, traditionally, people would actually get to this back um, in old Express days by requiring Express. And there was an export called utils. And they would use that to get to a lot of these low-level functions because they needed them. You got things like, how do you generate e-tags? How do you parse content type headers, stringify them, you know, parse range headers? Um, all kinds of different things. There's a lot of things where in the node core where it's 
it's available, it's possible to do certain things, but you have to add a ton of event listeners and do all these weird things. And so we bundle them up into a couple things like on finished and on headers to, under, to add hooks into the node core a lot easier that we use in ourselves. Um, and then to kind of like give like an idea of how this actually fits into the actual structure. So this is a very, very simplistic view of the dependencies. It's not all the dependencies, just a few of them just to kind of like highlight how it actually fits in these three organizations. So up in Express.js, you have Express itself, and then it's middleware, which of course aren't a dependency of Express. Um, Pillar.js, you actually have some named ones. Are, there's a module called router. That's, that is Express's router. So if you ever wanted to actually do the same thing where it's like you, you app.get, app.post, app.put, all of that is actually available in this module called router. So you don't even, if you don't care about anything else but routing in Express and you don't need a sugar, then you could actually just require that module directly. Um, send is another pretty popular one to direct require. Um, that's pretty much all our handling of how do you read static files off the file system, how do you output that um, to the client, which incorporates some things like ranged header handling and conditional requests and a couple things like that. Um, and then you have final handler, and that's kind of like, that's how we actually do, like, if you don't have any specific thing, how do we write out the 404s or those 500s from those errors that you're giving or not handling anything? And that's kind of like all the logic for that. Um, and in fact, com if you combine router and final hand handler together, you actually pretty much have, ex you have almost everything that Express is without Express itself, minus the sugar, um, which we will be exporting into another module. Um, soonish. Then under that, you have JSHTP. So that has like the send module needs to generate e tags. It will do it through there. It needs to understand if a conditional request is going to be a 304 or a 200 based on if the cache is fresh or not. So that's a fresh module. Range parser parses range header. Then on final handler, for example, also has this, a dependency on onfinish. So does send as well. Um, and that's kind of like how to hooks into all the stuff to understand when a response, for example, is finished, so it can clean up file descriptors and send. Even, no matter what, if the response got cut off, even if the client cut it off, this thing will trigger. And so we'll understand that we have to clean it up. And all of this is available for, especially like the re biggest reason we're splitting this up is because a lot of these third-party module middleware um, needs to do a lot of these similar things. And so we kind of like say, hey, you don't have to reinvent these wheels. You know, you can just use this. They're welcome to reinvent anything, though, of course. <laughs> um, and so from there, I just kind of like wanted to touch a little bit about our road to 5.0. So Express is currently 4.0 actually released over a year ago. Um, 5.0 is has an alpha currently published, um, and we actually are, are actively working on things. So these are a few different things. These are not everything that's going to be in Express 5. They're not even what is definitely going to be in Express 5, but they are all the stuff that we actually either have current code proposals or active discussions on right now. Um, and a lot of them are really cool, like native promise support and routing. So this doesn't get rid of callbacks or anything like that, but a lot of people these days, um, they like using promises, and they want to be able to um, use promises in their routing like their middleware, they want to just return a promise, for example, and let it you know, go to the next or not, depending on resolve or reject. And exactly how that works is actually in a lot of discussion. There's actually a few different proposals uh, that we're working through and trying to figure out what would be the best and most compatible for the existing, because we would love, to, we would hate to break everybody from this, especially with it being the entry point, so many books written on this, is that we actually care a lot about that. Um, Improved template rendering system right now. You didn't really realize this, but we actually read the templates off your file system synchronously. Um, now, by default, when you're in production mode, it will cache the template in the memory. So we don't actually, we only synchronously read on first, but that's a big pain point. We would like that to not do any sync actions because that's the best way for everybody. So that requires redoing the way the whole template system works. Uh, which is being worked on. Um, improved query string handling. There's a lot of discussions all about query string handling and the way it works there. And 
how you should parse it and how you shouldn't parse it. And so kind of like has a lot of discussions about how we can actually make that a lot better for you guys. Cookie handling is a big one. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have used Express. If you ever use cookies, you've got to require that cook. You're probably requiring co cookie parser module. Kind of ridiculous. Cookies are like a pretty center part. Yet Express can set cookies built into it. So both setting and getting will actually be built into Express of Sugar um, is the idea here. Because um, it's just a basic thing to do. Um, we're working on new route syntax additions. So Express 4 had increased, really increased the amount you could do with the Express routing. So you can always use regular expressions. It's actually you know, very extremely flexible. But a lot of people like using the strings because they're, ve they're very easy to read and they provide a bunch of different features. So we've gotten a lot of feedback over this time that Express 4 has been out. And we've kind of been piling up all the different requests that we're not going to be really backwards compatible exactly. Um, and we actually have a lot of them already implemented. Um, and router module itself will actually release a version that actually has that s the new stuff built in to try out even before Express 5 comes out, which is one of the nice things about decomposing all of our things. Um, but we have a bunch of new stuff that will be in there too. And then we're talking a lot about how to decompose our project structure even more. Like, so for example, the, the whole view rendering system and how that works is all actually still within Express itself. So we need to strip that out. All the sugar, so by sugar, I mean we attach. Express takes the raw rec and res from node core and attaches a bunch of stuff to it, like rec.ip, res.send. All those are very convenient, but it's hard. you have to use Express to get them. You can't just pick and choose. So we're moving to kind of like pull all of that out into their own modules. Express will still, of course, have them perfectly fine, but you can actually be able to use them even if you're not using Express. Um, so I want to end this a little bit with kind of like the biggest thing that we're working on, really, even more so than what is 5.0, and this a lot ties into it, is how, what, are, what we're working on to get more contributors to the Express code base, which is part of the whole incubation process, especially the participatory part. And this actually ties a lot into the transparency part as well. Um, so we're working a lot to get a lot of our project documentation out. Like the biggest one is what are our stated goals, right? We have pretty much Express has always just been lived goals is what you could say. Like lived in goals. We, we know what our goals are. <laughs> But you guys, it's hard for you to know what our goals are until you say something and then we tell you, no, that doesn't make sense according to our goals. You know, not a great way. I mean, it, I guess it's some way, but it's not great. So we're working on getting those goals stated. Plus, it really helps, especially when you bring on new contributors. So there's an understanding of what it is. Also, the community can understand what they are. And then until you understand what they are, it's hard to even know what to object about. You can't say, I don't, like, I don't, I don't think that that should be a goal of the project. You don't know without it being written down. Um, we're working on contributing guides. So we have actually part of the incub incubation process is we brought a default contributing guide. It's pretty generic. Um, and we've actually gotten a bunch of feedback on it. And we're trying to make that not only be more specific to the Express project and how it's managed, um, rather than just make pull request, blah, blah, blah. Maybe they, we should tell them they, need, they should make it on a different branch, how they should decide, stuff like that. Um, but also try to get these contributing guides out so they can actually apply it to all of our different repos in those three orgs, because right now it's just in the Express org. Um, we're trying to get that very org. Sadly, that structure that I presented on is actually the most documentation we have about our organization structure besides just what's in the heads of the TC. So we're working on actually getting that documented and up on our website. Um, so that will be awesome when we get that. Um, it will make a lot more sense to people coming in and like saying, well, there's a lot of people who would think like, you know, those other orgs, they don't have to do with Express or like the same people or anything like that. And really it is. It's just a way to manage these dozens of modules. Um, we're also working to better document our location of resources. So what I mean by that is like, where do people ask for help? How, what, you know, where do they file issues? How should they do that? You know, who are, you know, who are the TC members, which we actually just recently added, you know, and how, how do I see these meetings? So we actually, I just created a YouTube channel recently, so we'll be getting that up on the doc for all these recorded meetings. 
you know, how do I watch them live if I wanted to? How do I know what's the upcoming one? So we're working on trying to, to document all the locations of those things. Um, and finally, we're working on some level up guides, um, which is part of being participatory and transparent. Like, when people contribute code, I mean, what if they, what if, you know, for people who say, I really want to be a, I want to have commit bits, essentially, on either the Express module or one of the other modules in our orgs, right? What is the actual process instead of it just being like however someone feels that day? Like, try to get that kind of written down and then how they would become a TC member, which is partially documented in our governance, but it's still very generic, you know, and we want it to be a lot better. So we're working on a lot of these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, thanks everyone. That was great. That was really great, man. It was looking to see you. All right, everybody. I, I hope you had a great time. Um, really, really, I can't encourage you enough. Uh, if you've ever thought about doing anything on core, please come back tomorrow morning. We have so many great mentors uh, in town, including people that know very deep things about Node that you'll probably never be able to get access to again. Um, so really, uh, tomorrow's Code and Learn. It, it, we, we have an opportunity for you to contribute to any part of core if you have any kind of skill set. So, so please come tomorrow morning. Um, even if you already have plans, just cancel them. Uh, and that's it, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's been great. All right.